And welcome once again. You found us on The Verdict. Mick Cornett, Kent Myers, glad you're with us. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And this week we got one of our most interesting people dealing with the most topical issues you can imagine. And there's a lot going on in the world. Well, there is. Uh, Mike McCarville, we found him. <laughs> and he's coming to be with us again to talk about a lot of things going on in Oklahoma uh, nationally and other, other, other places. That's right. We'll get his take locally. But uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in what's going on in Washington right now. And I'd love to hear what Mike thinks and how it might impact us right here in Oklahoma. Yeah. Well, he's always got uh, not just a view. He's got an informed view. And we'll be looking forward to hearing what that is. It's coming up today on The Verdict. A greener planet, cleaner air, a healthy economy, national security, a smaller deficit and a stronger dollar, green jobs, better jobs, energy independence, warmth and light and transportation. The reasons Chesapeake champions natural gas include your children and grandchildren, your community and its economy, it's schools, roads, and charities. More hope for the future. More confidence in the direction of our nation. The need for energy that's clean, affordable, abundant, and very American. These are the reasons Chesapeake champions natural gas every day. Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. And Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today we have one of our most favorite guests. Uh, we always tell him when he's here he is the favorite guest, but he really almost is. So we have nobody more favorite than Mike McCarville joining us today for his 14th appearance on The Verdict. He's a former talk show host and uh, news director of KTOK Radio, a blogger of some uh, renown around the state and elsewhere. He's the uh, creator and the uh, uh, keeper of the uh, McCarville Report, which is available online. He is Mr. Oklahoma Insider insofar as politics is concerned, and we're sure glad you join us today. Thank you, sir. Now, I understand that when I get to number 30, my 30th appearance, I get start getting paid to do this, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah, thank yeah, you very right. much. We quit paying you in coffee cups. <laughs> okay, very, very good. Yeah. I appreciate it. Nothing will assure you good. stop at 29 more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's true. It's good to be with you guys. <laughs> well, I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I need a, some glossary help here, first of all. Okay. Now, I know the midterm elections are in 2010. So mm -hmm. what do you call Correct. the elections that are the mid of the midterm elections? What do you call the 09 elections? I think elections? these are double off your elections. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you're President Obama and uh, his Minions, I guess you'd just assume they hadn't occurred. Well, the president at least when it comes some, to New Jersey and Virginia, the president took some risk here because he decided he to get involved yeah. in in these elections that were risky, 
and um, and were kind of on the line. And one of them, it didn't look like he was. They were going to win anyway. But one of them was kind of up in the air. Put himself and, on the line. And your yeah. thought on the t the two gubernatorial elections that the, well, the Democrats uh, both I, lost? Well, I think there were actually. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I think the uh, in Virginia and uh, New Jersey, of course, the governors, uh, Republican candidates for governor won. And to me, the important thing about both of those is that in both cases, they really weren't even very close. The races were not even very close. And in Virginia, the Republicans elected not only a governor, they elected a lieutenant governor and an attorney general. It was a clean sweep of the top offices uh, on the ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I think that portends or indicates a shift in public opinion because, you know, we, we joke about Virginia being uh, Northern Virginia being Democrat and Southern Virginia being Republican leaning. And this time around, uh, even in those counties right up at uh, Buttress, uh, the District of Columbia, they went Republican big time. Right. So whether it's a sea change election or whether it's just an indication of the, the uh, dynamics of the way the campaigns played out, the candidates, the, the, uh, the issues they ran on, who knows. But I should note that the Democrats, of course, won the New York congressional race. They also won the California race. Neither one of those was totally unexpected. The race in New York, of course, drew a lot of uh, attention because the uh, Republican in name only, as she was called, uh, uh, lost uh, endorsements to the conservative party candidate and then eventually withdrew. Uh, but that was a Democrat win, and it was by a fairly substantial margin. Let's talk, uh, go to the uh, governor's race here. And talk about the we contenders. have one of those coming up, don't we? We, we do. At least some are acting like yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, you know, here we are. <coughs> excuse me, a year in advance, and and we already know literally in essence who the main candidates are. I mean, there's not. I don't think there's going to be a surprise on either side, either on the Democratic side or the Republican side. Uh, on the Democratic side, we've got Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins, and Attorney General Drew Edmondson, two heavyweights, if you will, on the Democratic side of the, the equation. And uh, right now, I wouldn't bet either way. On the Republican side, we've got uh, Mary Fallon, of course, the congresswoman from uh, the 5th District, Oklahoma City area, and the State Senator Randy Brogdon from Owasso. Uh, Fallon, obviously, the clear front runner for the Republican nomination. And that's evidenced, I think, by the latest campaign finance reports that show Brogdon raising just literally a fraction of what any of the other three, and Fallon in particular, uh, have been able to raise. Now, now Brogdon's argument is that he doesn't need as much money, <coughs> excuse me, as Fallon, because he's going to out organize her. He's going to have the better field operation, if you will. Uh, that remains to be seen, but but that's his mm -hmm. presentation. So he anyway. he needs low turnout. He needs he needs that that, that, would, that, that very would, core that, Republican exactly. voter. That You've might learned your political lessons right. well, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> yes. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, a yeah. low turnout would benefit him, but I I think it's probably going to be a pretty high turnout. And she will attempt to try to build voter turnout, but at the same time try and save money for the general election. Oh, absolutely. And you know this this idea of candidates saving money. I've got a piece up on my uh, site today uh, that has to do with the the, uh, the the burn rate of the candidates for governor. That is to say, what percentage of the money raised have they already spent? There are four candidates so far. They've raised about three million all combined. They've spent about 1.4 million. That's a burn rate, all of them together, of about 40 percent. Now, taking them individually, Jerry Askins has raised 670 thousand. She spent 245 thousand. Gives her a burn rate of about 36 and a half percent, somewhere in that vicinity. Randy Brogdon has raised only 123 thousand. He's only spent 70 thousand. Pales in comparison to the others. But his burn rate is very high because he's raised a few dollars. He's over 57 percent. Drew Edmondson raised 1.3 million, far and away the, the leading uh, fundraiser. He spent 541,000, burn rate of 40.4 percent. Mary Fallon raised 872,000. She's second in the money sweepstakes. She spent 423,000, uh, burn rate of 48 and a half percent. So the question is, from this point on. How much money are these candidates going to be able to save of the resources they raise? And you know, we've just gone through this uh, mayor's race up in Tulsa. Two candidates, Dewey F. Bartlett Jr. and a Democrat, Tom Adelson, the state senator. Uh, a mayor's race, Mr. Mayor. More than $2 million raised and spent in that race. 
where there's a lot of money to be spent. And I'll tell you another thing about the campaigns in this ever-evolving uh, direction that campaigns is headed. It's hard to get your message out because the, oh. the, 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 the people's attention is so splintered these days with the Absolutely. social media aspects, Absolutely. the television uh, shares starting to decline, every show except this one, which, of course, is, is always expanding. I will never forget, in Henry Bellman's second race for governor, well, what was that, 86, I guess it was, or somewhere along in there? Is this a quiz? Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, my memories <laughs> go away. Anyway, uh, his campaign right. manager, Joe Albaugh, who later became uh, George Bush's campaign manager, told me that he was going to do something that had never been done in Oklahoma politics before. He was going to put together a cable television buy package on behalf of Governor of uh, Henry Bellman. That he th because his, his thesis was that you could penetrate target audiences. You could target your audience using cable. Today, that's standard operating procedure. Joe Albaugh was way ahead, way ahead of his time. And the same thing can be said today, uh, Mick, of, uh, of the Internet, uh, all of the blogs that are out there, all of the websites that are out there, all the news sites. Because more and more, I'm telling you, uh, younger people in particular are going to the Internet to get their political news. Mm -hmm. Whether it's all good or whether it's all true is sometimes open to question. But that's where they're going. Uh, if you were advising any one of these campaigns for governor and you were talking about burn rates, where would you at this point in the race want your candidate's burn rate to be? Somewhere around 40, 42 percent probably. Uh, and of course that's based on a lot of things. Every campaign is different and every campaign has to make different decisions. Some, some, one thesis is that you save every penny you can for when it counts, when you really got to have the money to spend. And the other thesis is that, well look, you spend it now to make sure you're in the race when the time comes. Right. So it's all in how much you can raise from here on out. And these candidates, I think Edmondson and Askins and Fallon, I think are going to have no problem, probably, raising all the money they can spend. Uh, Brogdon, I think, obviously is going to have some difficulty, in the primary anyway, uh, raising the kind of money uh, that uh, that he might like oh, to have. He needs some polling that shows he has a chance. That's correct. she's a heavyweight. That's correct. That's and, correct. And all the polling thus far shows her far and away the front runner. Mike McCarville, our guest today on The Verdict. We'll be right back. This can is called For All the Grandfathers, and I dedicate it to my grandfather, Franklin Allen. Me and him just had, like, a spiritual thing where I just learned lessons from him without him telling me anything. The three dots on the feather represent my immediate family, and as my grandfather told me about the Chickasaws, that family is the most important thing. To me, the eagle sees everything as our elders do, also representing my grandfather and his bravery in the Korean War. I actually just started on the wings for the eagles, and that's when my mother called and told me that he passed away. He took his journey. It's like somebody watching you when nobody's there. I guess he wanted me to finish it, so I finished it. He's been with me ever since. It shows how strong a Chickasaw family can be. Home values are down in some states, but not in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's home values have increased 4.2% during the past 12 months. Unlike some states where home values have decreased as much as 20%. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. There may be real estate problems in some states, but there has never been a better time than now to buy or sell a home in Oklahoma. One of the most affordable states in the country, Oklahomans are buying and selling homes every day. And an Oklahoma Realtor can show you how. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. That land next door was a mess. Take more than a lawnmower to revive that land. I heard the oil and natural gas people was cleaning up old oil sites, and it wouldn't cost us a flood nickel. Oh, yes, sir, it was quite a revival. The whole church showed up, want to make a playground for the kids. <laughs> it sure is a blessing. Verdict. We're dealing with Mike McCarville today. It's always a challenge for it's, you, isn't it? It's a handful, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's talk, we've been talking about governor's race. Let's talk about the uh, incumbent governor, Brad Henry, who's yes. going to be uh, out of a job here in a few months. 
Uh, what do you perceive uh, Governor Henry to do uh, after being Prediction governor? here on the verdict. Prediction in, time. In Mike McCarville's Look opinion. into our crystal ball. Whoa, let me gaze into that thing. I think uh, Governor Henry is going to wind up at the University of Oklahoma in some uh, high capacity. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of people who want him to run for the U.S. Senate, want him to do this and do that. Uh, based on every conversation I've had with those close to the governor, not talk to the governor himself, but those close to him, uh, including some of his closest advisor, he has no interest at all in going to Washington, D.C. He's got a young family. He, he just doesn't want to subject them to, to Washington, and I don't blame him for that. Uh, his wife is already positioned down at OU, the First Lady is, as the administrator of a foundation there, a very well-known foundation. And uh, I think all signs point to uh, him going to the University of Oklahoma when his uh, term is up, by hook or by crook. You mean by the, the, as the dean of the law school, or is, uh, is there, are could, there could other be. opportunities? That would be a logical place yeah. for him, sure. And I, I think the, the ultimate, uh, at least in the thinking of a lot of people, uh, is that uh, one day he might become uh, the president of the University of Oklahoma, succeeding, for example, David Moore. Okay, a lot of uh, interesting uh, maneuvering about uh, the next group of leaders for the Oklahoma State House and the, and the State Senate. Oh, yes. what's, what's going mm -hmm. on there? I, I always thought they waited until the, the current it, leadership was gone. It's before, like campaigns, Mr. Mayor. Stuff. It's like campaigns <laughs> anymore. They, they start three years in advance <laughs> instead, of, instead of nine months. It's <laughs> like everything else. Uh, there is a lot of jockeying going on, and uh, I mean, who knows where it's uh, where it's going to come down? Particularly in the state senate. Yeah, there are uh, three or four or five people, uh, members of the senate, jockeying for position, and one, uh, Senator Harry Coates uh, from over in, uh, in Pottawatomie County, in that area on Tecumseh and all over there, uh, claims to uh, uh, be close to having enough votes or to actually have enough votes because the Democrats yeah. are going to go with him which I'm sure has the hair up on the back of the necks of a few Republican senators. So is it, is it, he got some sort of bipartisan support to be, I, that to be is the leader, the, that to, is to the, be the Republican leader? That is the appearance that has been created. Yeah. And I, it's not over until the votes has are counted. Has that ever happened before? That seems odd to me. I always thought it was just straight party line vote and the, 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 the party well, that was in control just well, in, selected in, their person in the past, and that was it. it. Has been that, it has been that way. Uh, certainly, uh, I mean, the Democrats set the standard for all the years they were in control of the Senate. Mm -hmm. But that, yeah, you're right. That's the way it's been. Is this a, a rural-urban <clears throat> divide? Is there is there some aspect of that? No, in? I think uh, to a lot of people it's a philosophical thing. Okay. Uh, Coach is not perceived as being the most conservative Republican in the Senate. And, of course, the present leadership is perceived as being very conservative in Glenn Coffey. Any uh, thought on what uh, Glenn Coffey and uh, uh, Chris Benz are going to be doing? No, I really, I really don't. Uh, I think both of them uh, could uh, go into business, uh, uh, the coffee could uh, go back to law, uh, you know, who knows what they're going to do. Let me ask you another question. Uh, Scott Meacham just announced yes. recently mm -hmm. that he's yep. just leaving state government and going yes. back into the private sector. Uh, did that surprise you? Uh, <laughs> it, it did and it didn't. I had been told that he was going to, well, you had two camps. One camp insisted he was going to announce for re-election or was going to run for higher office, governor, attorney general, whatever, and another camp that said no. This guy's had his fill of this. He wants to go back to his family. That obviously is the viewpoint that won out in his mind, and he said so. And I take my hat off to him. I mean, a guy just recognized that he was missing out on a lot of important events in the lives of his kids, being in Oklahoma City all the time, and he wanted to, he wanted to go back home. Well, he's a relatively young man, presumably. He is he indeed. Could, uh, he could resurface come back at some time. Yeah, absolutely. Some later time. Yeah. Let's talk about blogging. You're, you're, uh, you have a, okay. uh, do you consider yourself a blogger, first well, of all? Well, I'm more of a news-driven website. I, it, I'm a blogger in the sense that occasionally I offer my opinion. Okay. But I'm not like most blogs in like everything I post, everything I write is my opinion. That, that's not the case. Okay. Well, what do you, the, 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 the whole evolution of bloggers and, and what impact oh, yeah. they can have on political campaigns. Become a and, tremendous and, force. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm often asked the, the question, uh, how, do you, how do you measure yeah. Uh, these, these bloggers, uh, and how do you even measure some so-called news websites? And there are a lot of them that obviously have a philosophical bent to them, uh, and most of them conservative these days, but there are a lot of liberal ones out there as well. And to me, it all come, well, a couple of things come down in, 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 in trying to measure bloggers. Uh, credibility, I mean, what are their bona fides? If they offer an opinion about something, uh, what, what, what is the background they have that qualifies them to offer such an opinion. Most of the time, at least in my opinion, what I see are ill-informed, uninformed rantings and ravings. 
Uh, I mean, bloggers that refer to the governor of the state of Oklahoma as Brad Boy. Now, I mean, you know, I sometimes refer to him as Governor Late, but <laughs> but it's with the utmost respect. And to, to, to repeatedly refer to someone as Brad Boy, I just think is demeaning. And it says it's more about the blogger than it does about the governor. Uh, and, and then there's the, uh, not only the credibility, but, but, but again, just the, the, the bona fides of the blogger. Uh, so, some of these bloggers are, are people who have no experience in politics, in government, in the news media, in anything else. And they don't bother to check out what they put up. They hear a rumor and boy, it's up. Uh, you know, they, they put it up. And for all the world to see. Because the thing that I love about the internet is the same thing I loved about live radio, Mick, is it's instantaneous. You know, you literally, but with blog, blogging on the internet is a bit different because with the internet, it goes worldwide instantly. Mm -hmm. It's not just locally, <clears throat> right. like as in, on the radio or television. It's, it's worldwide in a flash. Recently, the, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the health care legislation. Oh, yes. Um, and, and I think a lot of us went back to our civics class about how does a bill become law. Okay, so the House has done it, but what's the next step? I, I mean, people shouldn't get carried away here that this no. is a done deal no. at this point. So uh, what, bill, where is it? The bill now goes to the Senate where it's mm. dead on a doornail, in my humble opinion. <laughs> there are not the votes there. There are not the votes there to pass <laughs> way it. Way to kill a good story, yeah, Mike. There are not the votes there to pass it. Now, here's, here's going to be around the, the bush, Mike. <laughs> here's going to be a good story. A. Barack Obama is going to be twisting every arm in the Senate he can, which aren't very many. And uh, the Senate, if, if they take up the measure, if they try to pass any kind of a health care bill that does not include everything that Nancy Pelosi and the House Democrats put in it, then it's got to go back to the House for yeah. consideration of the Senate amendments. And then the House is going to try to put back into that measure everything they had in the original measure, and the Senate's again going to vote against it. It is going to be a laborious, contentious, uh, a process that ultimately, in my opinion, is probably going to result in nothing being done. Let me ask you a, a broader question. I think uh, many citizens would agree that some kind of fix or change in the health care system would be desirable. Um, most people, like myself, wouldn't have the foggiest idea what it ought to be, but it ought to do something, if possible, to bring down the cost and to make sure more people have health care available. But uh, do the Republicans have a plan that they're working on, that they're ready to bring out, or have they already brought it out about how they might fix that? Well, I think they have, they have, a, they have a plan that is uh, uh, considerably less ambitious in terms of the federal government getting in the mix uh, than the Democrat plan. Uh, to me, and you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Kent, the, uh, the, the, thing, the, the, the cost of health care is astronomical. Uh, I know from personal experience, it is just, it's debilitating to somebody, even those who have insurance. Uh, it, I mean, you know, you, you talk about eight or $10,000 hospital bills for a three-hour trip to the ER, and, you know, you're faced with 1000 to $2,000 part of that bill, or even 500 for most people. And it's uh, humongous, and the cost of prescriptions is just, they go up almost every month, it seems. So the cost of the health care system, to me, is the big problem. Whether we can ever figure out a way to get it down, I have no idea. The health plan, uh, the health care reform bill passed by the House, in my opinion, is not the way to get it down. I think costs would go up under that proposal. Hmm. And energy bill, yeah. anything going to happen this year? We just got about 30 seconds. I left. don't think so. Short answer. Well, we needed more than that. Oh, I mean, well, 30 seconds, me, not three seconds. Then let seconds. me expound. I think there will be, there will be some, there will be a, some. Sorry, effort. we can laugh for 20 seconds. <laughs> There will be an effort, I think, to, uh, to pass some kind of measure. Again, you're talking about a contentious Congress. Yeah. Whether the Democrats and the Republicans, the moderates, the liberals, the conservatives can get together on anything this yeah. year will be surprising to me. Yeah, I agree. Oh, nines, nothing's going to happen between it's, now and the end of the year. That's but right, because they're all looking to the 2010 election year. There's a lot of stuff going on in 10. And then things won't happen because it's an election then year. Then we'll be exactly right. Yeah. And it, uh, as <laughs> the Ain't world it turns. Yes, as the Mike, world turns. Mike, as always, thanks for coming in on The Verdict. Uh, Thank thanks you, guys. again. My Kent and I'll have a final word right after this. Yeah, 
All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political government and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. We are back wrapping up an edition of The Verdict with Mike McCarville. <laughs> Always fun. Always fun and really interesting. Uh, nobody around that knows more about what's going on in this state and uh, mm -hmm. elsewhere than Mike, and we're really pleased he'd give us the time. Mike does a good job also of, of gathering political information and putting it on his blog or his, his uh, website, so let me give that information there. It's uh, www.tmrcom.blogspot.com or you could just uh, put Mike McCarville's name into Google, and I bet that'll come right up. Hey, thanks for joining us today on The Verdict. We'll be back next week. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.